In Module 2 we introduced the concept of the inverse of a matrix and developed one method of finding it. Finding an inverse can be a time-consuming task if it's done by hand for a matrix larger than a 3x3. Three three. It'd be good to know if a matrix was non-singular before starting. This is where determinants enter the picture. Determinants tell us whether or not a matrix is non-singular. As we'll see in the next lecture, they also have other uses. In Lecture 12, we develop one more method of finding an inverse of a matrix. To do that, we'll need to understand minors and cofactors. We deal with those in the last part of this module. Here we have a matrix. Is it singular or non-singular? We'll be able to answer that question shortly. First, let's look at a pair of simultaneous equations. Here we have the general form, ax plus by is equal to p, cx plus dy is equal to q. Here we have the matrix form. We can solve for x and y to get the following. Just to refresh our memories, let's see how we solve for x. We have our equations, we'll solve for x. From equation 2, we subtract cx and divide by d, and so we'll have y is equal to q minus cx on d. We can substitute for y in 1, and that gives us ax plus b times q minus cx on d is equal to p. Now we can multiply 3 by d. We'll have adx plus bq minus bcx is equal to pd. We can rearrange and simplify. ad minus bc times x is equal to pd minus b. Q. Dividing through by AD minus BC, we have X is equal to PD minus BQ on AD minus BC. Similarly, we can solve for Y. Now, let's go back to our equations. What we notice is the solution for both X and Y have AD minus BC as the denominator. Clearly, the solution is undefined if AD minus BC is equal to zero. Let's see what that means. We can rearrange both of our equations so we have Y as a function of X. So for equation one, we'll have Y is equal to minus ABX plus P on B. And for equation two, we'll have Y is equal to minus C on D, X plus Q on D. If AD minus BC is equal to zero, that implies that A on B is equal to C on D. In other words, the slopes of our two equations are equal. So the graphs of these two equations are parallel lines. They don't intersect. There's no solution. If the denominator AD minus BC is non-zero, then we have a unique solution. This brings us to the determinant. The determinant is a unique scalar for a square matrix. This is the notation we use, the symbol for the matrix with a vertical line either side, or just determinant A. What is the determinant? Well, it's just the denominator we found earlier, where we have two equations and two unknowns. A matrix of coefficients is given here by A. The denominator is AD minus BC. We also show the determinant in this way, by writing out the matrix and again putting a vertical line on either side. For the 2 by 2, we have the product of the principal diagonal minus the product of the off-diagonal elements. This is a second-order determinant. In a moment, we'll look at higher-order determinants. The determinant tells us whether a system of equations has a unique solution. In other words, the equations are linearly independent. That corresponds to the rows in the matrix of coefficients being linearly independent. If two rows are not linearly independent, then we can perform elementary row operations and obtain an equation, or a row, where all the coefficients are zero. That would mean we would have n unknown variables and n minus one equations. If a system of equations has a unique solution, the matrix of coefficients will be non-singular, and the determinant will be non-zero. If we calculate that the determinant of a matrix is zero, 
then we know that it doesn't have an inverse. Here are some examples of our 2 by 2s. A, 10 times 5 minus 8 times 4 is equal to 18. B, 2 times 24 minus 8 times 6 is equal to 0. C, 8 times minus 3 minus 5 times 4 is equal to minus 44. So B is a singular matrix. Notice that row 2 is 4 times row 1. In other words, we could subtract 4 times row 1 from row 2 and end up with two zeros in row 2. Systems of two equations and two unknowns are pretty easy. What we really want to tackle is systems of three equations and three unknowns. So next we'll see how we can calculate determinants of 3 by 3 matrices. First we'll look at two more mechanical methods, then we'll examine a more general approach that allows us to find determinants for not only 3x3 three three matrices, but higher dimension matrices. The first method is to expand along the first row, as we say. These are the elements here. Let's see how we get that result. So we take the first element in the first row, we cross out the first column and the first row. We're left with a submatrix here. We write down the element A11 and we multiply it by the determinant of the submatrix that's left. So that's A22, A23, A32, A33. We already know how to find the determinant of a 2 by 2. We give that a plus sign. Next we go to the second element in the first row, A12. We cross out the first row and the second column. So that's the row and the column corresponding to that element. We write down the element A12. Again we have a submatrix that's left, A21, A23, A31, A33. Take the determinant, again that's the scalar, we multiply A12 by the determinant of the submatrix. For that term we have a minus sign. For the third term we have an element A13. We cross out the first row and the third column. Again, we have a submatrix. We take the determinant. So we multiply A13 by the determinant of that submatrix. A21, A22, A31, A32. And we have a plus sign there. So just repeating that, we find the determinant by multiplying the elements of the first row by the term of the submatrix that's left when the corresponding row and column are deleted. Now let's apply this method to an example. If we have a matrix, the vertical lines indicate that we're finding the determinant. Here's our solution. Let's work through how we get it in detail. We're expanding along the first row, so we take the first element in the first row, 5. We eliminate the first row and the first column leaves us with a submatrix. We multiply 5 by the determinant of that submatrix. 5, 4, 2, 1. We have a plus sign there. Next we take the second element in the first row. It'll be 8. We give that a minus sign. Eliminate the first row and the second column. We have a submatrix left. We take the determinant. It'll be 2, 4, minus 7, 1. And finally, the third element in the first row. Cross out the first row, the third column, plus 7, times the determinant, 2, 5, minus 7, 2. So that's equal to plus 5, times 5, minus 8. And that's equal to minus 8, times 2, minus minus 28 and the third term is equal to plus 7 times 2 times 2 4 minus 5 times minus 7 minus 35 that's how we get this line we do those calculations and we find the determinant is plus 18 so we know that this matrix has an inverse Another method of finding the determinant of a 3x3 matrix was developed by Pierre Saris in the first half of the 19th century. 
This is Saris rule. This is what we call a mnemonic rule. This is a rule that helps us remember how to calculate a determinant. We start with our 3x3 three three array of elements, and then we repeat the first and second columns. Starting at the top left, we create three products with the downward diagonals and give each a plus sign. Then from the bottom left, we create three products along the upward diagonal. We give these minus signs. Now we have six terms, three positive and three negative. If you go back to our previous method of expanding along the top row, you'll find you get precisely these six terms. At the start of this module, we want to know whether this matrix has an inverse. Well, now we know we can find that out by calculating the determinant. We'll do it using Saris rule. We write out the array of elements and then repeat the first two columns. And now we're ready to calculate the determinant. Determinant A is equal to, we start at the top left corner with a plus sign, to be 1 times 0 times 2, and on to the next term, be plus 2 times 2 times minus 1, and the last positive term will be 4 times 1 times 4, and now the negative elements, we have minus, minus 1 times 0 times 4, minus 4 times 2 times 1, minus 2 times 1 times 2. That's equal to 0 minus 4 plus 16 minus 0 minus 8 minus 4. Plus 16 minus 16 is equal to 0. Matrix A is singular. It doesn't have an inverse. We can't tell by direct observation, but row 3 is equal to 2 times row 1 minus 3 times row 2. That means if we use elementary row operations, we can get three zeros in row 3. We've looked at two specific ways of finding a determinant of a 3x3 three three matrix. Next we'll consider a method that can be used for any n by n matrix. The necessary condition is that we have sufficient patience. This is the Laplace expansion, also known as the cofactor expansion. The first method we used, expanding along the first row, is a particular case of this more general approach. The method was developed by Pierre Simon Laplace, a French mathematician, who lived at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th centuries. He's sometimes called the French Newton. In this method, we can evaluate the determinant of an n by n matrix using lower order determinants. In the earlier example, we expand along the first row. In the general case, we can expand along any row or any column. This is useful where there's one or more zeros in a row or a column. Here's a summary of the process. First, we'll define minors, then cofactors, and then we'll see how the determinant is calculated. We saw earlier that if we select an element of a matrix and delete the corresponding row and column, then we're left with a submatrix. The determinant of such a submatrix is called the minor. For example, for element 1, 2, we cross out row 1, column 2, and we're left with a submatrix, the determinant of which is the minor corresponding to element 1, 2. Recall that a determinant is a scalar, a minor with the correct sign, is called a cofactor. The sign of a cofactor is determined by this rule. We multiply the minor by minus 1 to the power i plus j. So in the case of the 1, 2 minor, we'll have minus 1 to the power 1 plus 2, 3. Minus 1 to the power 3 is minus 1, so we have a negative sign. If you work through that, you'll see how we had the sequence for the first row, plus, minus, plus. For the second row, it'll be minus, plus, minus. There's a minor and a cofactor corresponding to each element of the matrix. The determinant is the sum of the products of the elements by their corresponding cofactors. We saw this was the formula if we expand along row 1, and here for row 2 
and row 3. This is the general formula for expanding along a row, and this one for expanding down a column. In each case, we'll get the same answer. Here we're asked to find the determinant. Since we have a 0 in row 3, it's useful to expand along that row. This makes the calculation slightly easier. We'll expand along row 3. The determinant of a is equal to, we take the element in the first column, 6 times minus 1 to the i plus j, so it'll be 3 plus 1, and then the determinant of the submatrix, that will be 2, 9, 2, 4, plus 5 minus 1 to the 3 plus 2 times the minor 4, 9, 1, 4 plus the third term. Since the third element is 0, we know that the result there is 0. That's equal to plus 6, taking the sign into account. Uh, 2 times 4 minus 2 times 9 minus minus 1 to the power 5 is minus 1. 5 times 4 times 4 minus 1 times 9 plus 0. That's equal to minus 60 minus 35 is equal to minus 95. The Laplace expansion can be used for any n by n matrix. For example, with a 4 by 4 matrix, there are four elements and four corresponding cofactors, each of which has to be calculated from a 3 by 3 determinant. And those 3 by 3 determinants are calculated the way we've just seen. Similarly, with a 5 by 5 matrix, we'll have five elements and five cofactors, each of which is calculated from a 4 by 4 determinant, and so on. For a large matrix, if there are one or more zeros in a row or a column, it reduces the calculation considerably. Here we have the general form of the Laplace expansion that can be applied to any size matrix. In this course, the largest matrix will be a 3 by 3. We'll finish the module by reviewing the main properties of determinants. As we've seen, if a row or column contains only zeros, then the determinant is zero. The determinant of a transpose is equal to the determinant of the original matrix. The determinant of the product of two matrices, AB, is equal to the product of the determinants. Now, if we change two rows or two columns, the numerical value of the determinant will be the same. The sign will be the opposite. We can factorize individual rows or columns using this rule. However, if we multiply all elements by a common factor, then the determinant is k to the n times the original determinant. Here we see how one of our elementary row operations, the addition of a multiple of one row to another row, doesn't change the value of the determinant. Here we see the proof if one row is a multiple of another row, and then the value of the determinant is zero. In this case, column one is equal to column two. And the last one we've come across before, if we multiply all the elements of an n by n matrix by k, the determinant is k to the n times the determinant of the original matrix. In the next lecture, we'll look at how we can solve for particular variables using Kramer's rule, and then we'll see another way of finding the inverse, and so solving the system of equations.